Today we are going to talk about Bragg diffraction. So uh, Sir William Lawrence Bragg, he's a seminal figure in material science. You're going to hear his name quite a bit. Hopefully you've already heard his name before with Bragg's Law. Um, quick story time. Uh, so uh, my, uh, I had a professor when I was an undergraduate, Professor Lynn Hobbs, uh, and if you can believe it or not, he was a graduate student uh, of Bragg's. Uh, so, <laughs> um, he was a brilliant guy. Uh, he actually ran this XRD lab that we're going to uh, conduct uh, pretty soon in this class. Um, a genius. I'm obviously an expert on X-ray diffraction, which Bragg uh, essentially invented. And actually, he and his father uh, won the Nobel Prize for Bragg diffraction um, when he was 25. So, he's still the youngest to win the Nobel Prize, I believe. Um, and then he went with his father. So, I think those are two records. People always talk about the hitting streak or Cal Ripken's Iron Man streak in baseball that might be broken. I don't think these two things will ever be broken in science ever again. So, <laughs> but he won the Nobel Prize for Bragg diffraction again when he was 25. Um, so my professor Lynn Hobbs, uh, he's obviously a genius uh, and knew how to explain Bragg diffraction very, very, very well. Uh, and also he loved to um, he loved to ski and he loved to drink wine. Uh, and every uh, every occasionally when when he come back in the winter. Uh, every couple of years, he'd break his legs. So I don't know if those two were uh, combined, but anyways, uh, Bragg essentially understood this idea of you know looking at Young's um, Young's experiment, the double split experiment, and this kind of particle wave duality and constructive and destructive interference of waves and electrons. He had this ingenious idea that we could deduce the structure of materials and investigate them by using this concept of refraction. And specifically, we have to utilize. Uh, he's going to utilize X-rays. Why can't we use uh, a laser beam? Why can't we use a laser to kind of uh, um, to deduce the structure of materials? Well, what do we say? What are two conditions for diffraction? We need our regular space to raise obstacles, and we need that distance to be commensurate with um, essentially the wavelength of our beam. So, what is the distance in materials? Carbon, carbon bond. First quiz time. I just introduced it. 5.4 angstroms. What is the wavelength of a visible spectrum, lasers? Well, it's hundreds of nanometers, right? So these two, the conditions aren't met, so we can't use lasers. Instead, we could use, we can, and actually we will use copper alpha radiation, which has a wavelength of exactly 1.54 uh, to angstroms. So this is on the order of our spacing our atomic structures, and we have regular space obstacles, uh, or i.e. long range order in our systems. We're going to get to that in lecture two. So Bragg saw that we can deduce and find some of these interatomic distances using diffraction. So seems simple now, right? All he did was fulfill two uh, descriptions, and he found a, uh, basically a wavelength, uh, uh, a, a wavelength of a beam that can uh, that is commensurate around the size of our uh, spacings. But again, it was very, very difficult to kind of imagine that at the time and actually deduce that finding. So Bragg was a very, very uh, an ingenious person to say the least. So. This is what Bragg kind of encountered. So when we do X-ray diffraction, we are going to have essentially here, this is our source. So an X-ray source, you could actually watch this on our YouTube video. So we're going to shoot some incident beam that has some wavelength lambda. So wavelength. So we're going to shoot beams over here. So let's kind of draw the schematic. So this is S is our source. We're going to shoot here. We're going to have our kind of, or we could kind of draw it like, let's draw it like we have in lab. So in lab, we have our source, shoots uh, x-rays here. We have our samples here. So this is my sample. Sample. Uh, <laughs> I should do a different uh, kind of value here. It's kind of connected here. And then there's a detector that's kind of out here. So we're going to change the incident angle of this beam and the detector. So the x-rays are going to go here, bounce off the sample, and they're going to bounce off at an angle to theta to our detector right here. And that's just because of geometric reasons. So, our detector is going to be here, and that's going to be this angle. Uh, it's two theta angle away, as you can kind of see right here. So detector. So these are kind of just the you know the basics of the uh, of our XRD apparatus. So, but the key thing, the key finding, and the unbelievable thing that Bragg foresaw or you know uh, deduced and derived was, okay, we're going to shoot this incident radiation with some wavelength here. So imagine that we first have one beam or one you know wave of electrons kind of hitting here. So our wave, our first incident ray or beam or incident electrons go into here and they bounce off the sample and hit here. Now, if we have another incident ray, again, same wavelength, that's 
I'm going to go bounce here and hit the second. Again, we have these kind of two arrays or two lines or two planes. So planes of atoms. So we have these two planes of atoms. So right here, wavelength hits, bounces off here. Here, it's the second, uh, second plane of atoms and then bounces off. What is the condition that we need in order to get a signal? Well, we need constructive interference. Constructive. So we need to make sure that these two waves, this wave here, I'm going to call this 1, and then call this 2. We need to make sure that 1 plus 2 add to double our amplitude. And we need to make sure that 1 and 2 are in the same, are in phase, excuse me. In phase, not in the same phase. <laughs> I'm looking for, I'm already jumping ahead to our phase diagrams. So let's look at kind of what's happening here. So I have the ray that goes into here, bounces off here. The second ray goes here. And if you draw kind of some geometry, now I know that you all probably have, you know, definitely have totally taken statics at this point. Uh, you're all geometry expert, experts. But if we look at this, the distance that's traveled here, if we draw kind of this line here and here. The only difference between these two uh, you know, instant beams is that we're traveling for the second beam you know, that's hitting this second uh, array of atoms. We're traveling this extra distance AB and BC. So if we want these two planes, these two waves to be in phase, I need to make sure that the extra distance traveled AB plus BC is going to be some integer multiple of the wavelength. This is just saying that we need to some an integer multiple times the wavelength so that we're in phase. If this was 0 0.5 times that wavelength, then we'd be out of phase, right? It'd be like adding the cosine and we'd cancel out. So we need to make sure that we're in phase, that we have the same kind of that extra distance is the same wavelength so that we are basically in phase with that wave. So hopefully that makes uh, kind of sense. We need to make sure it's some n, an integer number. So it could be 1, 2, 3, integer number times the wavelength of that instant, of this instant beam here. So, well, well, we also now have some geometric design. So how can we describe A, B, and B, C? Again, this is where your, uh, <laughs> this is where your uh, geometry comes into play. So it's just going to be, again, that DHKL. So this is the distance between our interplanar, it's our interplanar distance. So this distance here is DHKL. You have your hypotenuse. So we can describe A, B as DHKL sine theta. And this is how you get... Bragg's law. We need, need to have this constructive interference. The extra distance traveled by the second wave, the second instant beam, A plus B, the extra distance has to be an integer number of the wave uh, times the wavelength of our beam to be in phase so that we add those signs. So once you add that together, and lambda equals 2 dhkl sine theta Bragg. Now notice here, this is really, really critical. We are going to measure in our instron an intensity versus two theta plot, because we're measuring this detector, which is at an angle two theta, as we rotate kind of our sample around uh, and investigate these different angles. Why are we investigating these different angles? Well, because there's different distances. Again, there's three dimensionality to this, because there's, there's gonna be different distances. And you see, importantly here, that there's this inverse relationship between theta is inversely proportional to one over d, the interplanar distance. So we're going to see peaks at these different distances, and each of these are going to indicate different, uh, basically, characteristic distances in your material, different interplanar spacings for metals, and different characteristic distances for other metals. We're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but it'll be clarified once we kind of uh, go into the lab. So the key idea here is that for small angles, we're looking at very, very large distances. For large angles, we're looking at very, very small distances. So it's kind of this inverse this reciprocal space. Hopefully you've seen that before in Fourier. It's inverse time space, so that's frequency space. But more on this if you take my engineering 110 course. So, uh, so the key thing here is this two theta is different. It's twice that theta brag. So uh, with this interplanar distance, we can then, again, looking back at our lab hand now, if we're looking at not qubit, cubic materials, uh, we could figure out What's this lattice parameter A? So the lattice parameter spacing in our kind of material. And HKL is in there. You get much more on this in our structure lecture. So we could do a quick, quick example uh, and actually kind of start to plug this in. So if I want to uh, measure the 110 plane of iron, I'm going to use copper alpha radiation. So 
uh, and then the readout from my diffractometer shows a very strong peak at 44 degrees point seven. Calculate the lattice parameter. So we want to figure out A. So we just have iron is a cubic material. It could be either BCC or FCC. I didn't even kind of uh, indicate that in this experiment. Uh, but again, not the point of this <laughs> very specific lecture. So we just saw that our EHKL is going to be A over square root H squared plus A squared plus L squared. Go ahead and check back in on that. Make sure that I've still got it right. Oh, Professor Stein still got it memorized <laughs> for all these years. So my HKL indices, H equals 1, uh, uh, K, H, K, L equals 1, and L equals 0. So you can kind of plug in there. What's our DHKL? Well, we need to figure out that from N lambda equals 2 DH sine of theta. So theta is not going to be 47 degrees, because again, remember, this is equal to 2 theta. So theta equals 44.7 degrees divided by 2. So you plug that in here. We know that our lambda is copper alpha radiation, 1.54 angstroms. We're going to assume that this is, again, just an integer multiple, the first order uh, refraction. So there could be second order, two orders, but usually we're going to set, uh, we're going to deal with first order deflection. So our integer number is just going to be equal to 1. Why do we have to have that integer number? Because we need to be constructively interfering. So we have that. So we know this. We know this. Excuse me. We know what theta is. We solve for DHKL. Uh, once we have DHKL, we know that. We know this, this, this. Solve for alpha, or for our lattice parameter. So there you go. Your first question, uh, and you can kind of do the math at that point, um, and double check with me if you have any questions, but the key idea here with Bragg diffraction is this. You have an instant ray. It's going to hit off of your first plane of atoms. Another beam is going to hit the second plane of atoms. To deduce this distance, this DHKL, the distance between planes, we need to make sure um, that these two instant beams constructively interfere. So the second beam that's hitting the other plane is going to travel some extra distance.